about airway management after the induction of general anesthesia from the patient's perspective. And here, of course, I'm referring to accidental awareness of airway management um, during a supposed general anesthesia. So my source for this, of course, was the NAT5 study, um, fairly recently published, of accidental awareness during general anesthesia. <clears throat> very, very um, sobering study. And uh, in fact, probably the study that I have um, taken away and applied most to my practice, um, to, to fine tune my practice. I haven't had a case of, a, of accidental awareness, nor do I want one before I finish my career. And this is a, an excellent study. But uh, as far as what the study had to offer, as far as airway management uh, was concerned, during the induction of general anesthesia, RSI was a particular risk. Um, and as far as RSI, uh, when thiopental was used during RSI, or when there was no opioid used as part of the induction sequence during RSI, those were risk factors for accidental awareness of airway management under supposed general anesthesia. Um, similarly, difficult airway management was also a risk factor for accidental awareness under an, uh, general anesthesia. And the comments here made by the authors of the, uh, the NAV5 study were that uh, specifically when difficulty was encountered, <clears throat> accidental awareness often occurred when it wasn't clear if the plan was to allow the patient to emerge from general anesthesia or if the plan was to carry on with an additional attempt or two using hopefully different uh, devices. Um, and if that was the plan to carry on with additional attempts, it was probably most important to maintain hypnosis with additional intravenous doses of uh, sedative hypnotic rather than attempting to maintain a lack of awareness with a volatile with, with face mask ventilation. That did appear to be a risk factor for accidental awareness of uh, general anesthesia. So make a decision, either is it waking the patient up or is it uh, further attempts, if making further attempts, maintaining hypnosis with additional doses of sedative hypnotic, probably the way to go. Uh, finally, at induction, <clears throat> the uh, NAP5 authors found that induction agent underdosing, especially in the obese patient, was a risk factor for uh, uh, awareness under general anesthesia. And this is one of the case vignettes published in the NAP5. Uh, middle-aged, very obese patient underwent urgent surgery at night. Uh, induction was with fentanyl 100, uh, thiopental 500 milligrams, so that would be an entire vial, which when you think about it, in a 150 kilo person, for example, would be less than four milligrams per kilogram. Uh, and sucks 100 milligrams, which would probably be underdosing in terms of getting optimized conditions in a 150 kilo person. Unexpected difficulty with intubation, uh, after repeated intubation attempts, no further drugs were administered, the case was abandoned, and the patient awoken. Unfortunately, the patient did hear discussion about intubation difficulty and instruments in his mouth, felt instruments in his mouth, and was unable to move. So it must have been horrible for the patient, again, probably relating to uh, medication underdosing for uh, his body habitus. So again, risk factor for accidental awareness during airway management. Um, lastly, as far as airway management, uh, accidental awareness during emergence and extubation, comments were 20% of all of the NAT5 cases occurred uh, during emergence and extubation relating to airway management. Um, residual neuromuscular blockade at the end of a case appeared to be a risk factor or premature ending of anesthetic agents um, before return of full neuromuscular function. A non-use of the nerve stimulator <clears throat> was a factor in most of these cases. Um, so prevention, obviously, important to ensure full return of full motor function before emergence and extubation. So that, of course, is 90% return of train of four. It is most important to use nerve stimulator in 100% of patients uh, who receive neuromuscular blockers. I'm afraid in Canada it's not ubiquitous. Um, I worry about that. There's no reason for that. I consider it just pure laziness on the part of the uh, clinician to not use a nerve stimulator. So that my plea would be to those of you on standard committees, if it's not yet a standard in your country, I do think it needs to be a standard in your country to use a nerve stimulator in 100% of patients who receive a neuromuscular blocker. Finally, then, let's talk about the patient's perspective after the operation is complete. And here, of course, I'm talking about uh, side effects and uh, complications relating to airway management. The first of which is sore throat. 
I have to admit, I am always impressed that I can deliver a patient to the recovery room after being assaulted by a surgeon with sharp objects, and yet the first comment that they make on arrival in the recovery room is, my goodness, I have a sore throat. Not a, not a comment about the surgical incision, but about a sore throat. So it's a pretty u ubiquitous uh, side effect, unfortunately. Up to 40% of patients uh, who've undergone tracheal intubation do complain of sore throat, perhaps uh, a little less with a supraglottic airway, but it's still not a zero. Um, nice review article by Dr. Karim uh, el Baghdadli, recently published in Anesthesia 2016. He did a systematic review of the literature um, and was able to <clears throat> glean uh, down a number of uh, recommendations for the, the prevention of sore throat, one of which was for the use of a generally smaller endotracheal tube if you have the choice. Um, cough pressure monitoring in all patients, and I must say I, I do do this in my practice, so any intubated patients I do monitor the cough pressure and adjust it appropriately, and similarly I also like to adjust the cough pressure of my supraglottic airways uh, to uh, an appropriate cough pressure. Um, prevention of sore throat, the use of neuromuscular blockers for tracheal intubation, um, unless there's a good reason to not do so. Use of a bronchial blocker instead of a double lumen tube was associated with a lower occurrence of sore throats. And a number of studies that have looked at the effect of topical lidocaine or topical steroids or topical NSAIDs, they generally do show a beneficial uh, effect, but, but not always. So sore throat. Uh, let's move on, though, to perhaps more serious complications arising from uh, tracheal intubation. Uh, one of which is a, is a retinoid dislocation. So this is um, a fairly significant complication uh, that can occur. Risk factors for a retinoid dislocation, I think it's fairly infrequent, but difficult intubation is a risk factor. Not using a stylet in a tube is a risk factor, perhaps relating to the multiple pokes that the larynx might then take to get the tube to go into the right location. Low BMI, funnily enough, is a risk factor for a retinoid, a retinoid dislocation. And in one of the articles I read, it uh, speculated that this might be in the rheumatoid arthritis population uh, who may be at, uh, at risk of uh, cricoretinoid uh, arthritis, and that might put them at risk in turn of, uh, of retinoid dislocation. And bariatric procedures are a risk factor for retinoid dislocation, probably due to the, to, to the use of that great big bougie down the esophagus. Recognition of retinoid dislocation, hoarseness, especially, and persistent sore throat. I worry about this a little bit, especially as more and more procedures get done on an outpatient basis. Unless we follow our patients up, we might miss the persistent hoarseness occurring for, for days and days and days that might be symptomatic of an retinoid dislocation. So probably a good thing as a, as a system issue to, to make a follow-up telephone call to the patient post-op. Um, if it's suspected, of course, prompt referral to an ear, nose, and throat surgeon is, uh, is mandatory uh, or advisable uh, so that he or she can do nasopharyngoscopy to rule in or rule out to retinoid dislocation because uh, for optimal <clears throat> outcome, um, surgical relocation of that uh, dislocated or retinoid does need to occur within three weeks. Prevention. You know, honestly, uh, I worry here that in the era of hyperangulated video laryngoscopy where where some clinicians, not all, might encounter difficulty getting that tube to the larynx, that we might see an increasing incidence of a retinoid dislocation. So I do think it's important to train up all of our, our anesthesia and intensive care staff in optimal technique in, in getting optimal tube delivery to and through the larynx when using especially a hyperangulated video laryngoscopy blades. Um, Postoperative complications, teeth or dental trauma, um, Obviously, poor condition of teeth or dental restorations, cap teeth, crowned teeth, especially the upper central incisors, a risk factor for, uh, for dental damage. Difficult laryngoscopy and intubation, obviously a risk factor. Oral, oral airway is used as a pipe block is a risk factor for uh, dental damage. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I did a medical legal review of a, of a case with, uh, with damage of the teeth some years ago, and uh, what I found out, at least in the literature at the time, is that biting down on an oral airway used as a bite block at the end of the case was a, a higher risk factor for dental damage than was laryngoscopy or intubation. So prevention here, um, I use nothing but a rolled gauze uh, as a bite block. Uh, 
And if I do have a patient presenting now for surgery who does have dental restorations done to the, especially to the upper central incisors, I do go immediately to a hyperangulated video laryngoscope blade where I do feel there's a little less risk of uh, perhaps pressure on the upper teeth or, or levering against the upper teeth. Finally, in this talk then, in terms of post-operative complications, I do wish to, uh, to address injury to the palatal glossal arch. Again, a complication occurring now with the hyperangulated, hyperangulated video laryngoscope blades in particular. This is not a serious complication, but it's certainly one that makes you look bad to the patient and you look bad to your colleagues and to the, uh, to the uh, ear, nose, and throat surgeon to which the patient then gets referred for repair. Um, so it's a particular risk, I believe, when the, uh, the dedicated rigid stylets are used in an endotracheal tube for video laryngoscopy, especially hyperangulated blade video laryngoscopy. This review in 2017 um, brought together 23 case reports that have been published in the, uh, in the world literature on this injury occurring. I think 23 separate case reports are a lot uh, on any complication anywhere in medicine. Um, and I worry that 23 published case reports translate to 2,300 occurrences in real life or even 23,000. Perhaps more worrying than that study even was this study published from a single center that documented nine occurrences of this complication. And it's an easy one to prevent. Uh, and the way to prevent it is that I think it's important to look in the patient's mouth when first placing the blade. Having placed the blade past the palatoglossal arch, <clears throat> only then look at the screen of the laryngoscope to complete blade placement and perform laryngoscopy. Then I think it's extremely important to look back directly in the patient's mouth until the tip of your stylated tube is past the, pal the palatoglossal arch. And again, only at that point, look back at the screen in order to guide the tube the rest of the way to the larynx and guide it further down the trachea. So again, look in the patient's mouth during laryngoscopy, complete your laryngoscopy looking at your screen, look back to the patient's mouth until that stylated tube is past the palatoglossal arch, only then look back at the screen in order to complete your navigation to the larynx and through the larynx with the tube. And if you do that four-step approach, almost never should you suffer that uh, indignity of uh, putting a tube accidentally through the palatoglossal arch. So in summary then, we talked about uh, airway management from the patient's perspective. Before the operation, not a lot of signal that patients are particularly worried about airway management. Perhaps they don't know that they should be worried about it before the operation. During the operation, we talked about <clears throat> the patient's perspective um, of awake intubation. We talked about NAP5's offerings on accidental awareness during airway management. And finally, after the operation, we talked about some of the common complications and some of the less com common complications together with uh, their preventive measures. Um, thanks for listening, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>